Um, I mean, it's very encouraging to see so many people here for an event which is described as uh, Europe and Israel, a new paradigm. And I work for the European Union, but I'm also British um, for my sins. And I, uh, I wonder how many would come to a Europe and the UK, a new paradigm conference. I think at the moment, given the uh, state of the uh, perceptions of the EU in the UK, there might not be as many as there are here. Um, so, uh, but I, but I, I'm constantly sort of brought up against this, uh, this, this problem that we seem to have in terms of uh, the perceptions of our relationship at the moment. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had to take my car to be fixed. Uh, it's a good European car, of course, um, and it has the diplomatic number plates on, on the back. And the man in the garage said, "Oh, we're so." Which mission are you with? And I said, oh, with the European Union. They're hostile to us, aren't they? <laughs> um, so I, this does seem to be a perception not just played out in the media, but through uh, quite a wide range of people uh, uh, who I meet uh, while, while here in Israel. Which is actually quite a disappointment to me, I must say. I mean, relations are, in fact, amazingly good uh, in, in many ways. And I think sometimes that if you look at uh, how things are perceived uh, in the press, uh, you sometimes get a false how a relationship really is. And as the Conrad Adenauer Shift have been so kind to organize a, a, a co-organized today's event as well, I perhaps just point to the, the fact that in the UK, whenever, particularly whenever we have a World Cup uh, on, if you looked at the British press, you would think the worst relations we have in the world are with Germany. Uh, but uh, I think that you know, actually our relations are very, very strong. Uh, and the relations between the EU and Israel are very, very strong as well, and very close. Um, when our ambassador tried to outline some of those this morning, um, I'm, you know, I've been asked to look at some of the issues about what can be done to improve future cooperation. Um, and the first thing I would say is actually, I think, something which uh, Shlomo Arbaneri said as well. Let's keep things in perspective. I think that's a very important uh, message. The EU is not working to, uh, to boycott Israel. It's not working to develop sanctions against Israel. Uh, we're promoting our relations, we're promoting trade, yeah, I mean, just at the beginning of uh, this morning, uh, Gilliron referred to uh, comments which I think Minister Lapid had made at the INSS conference uh, a couple of months ago, where he was quoted as saying that Brussels was considering abrogating the EU-Israel Association Agreement. Um, I mean, we immediately in our office here put out a den denial of that, uh, a denial which is also true, uh, but denials, even if they are true, sometimes don't have the same impact as the original comments, and that seemed to be the case in, in in this instance. And this idea of boycott, boycott, boycott has been something which has been playing out now for, for, for a number of months uh, and is something which I think people are not really feeling on the ground. And it was very encouraging to hear Shagra Brosh's comments that uh, the business community, uh, the business community that he's working with is not reporting any problems in its relations with Europe. So let's also keep things a little bit in perspective uh, on these, uh, these famous EU guidelines. Uh, I mean, I also want to look forward rather than, rather than back, I've been asked to, but um, I, I, I can't resist the, uh, the option of, uh, the opportunity rather, to, uh, uh, to comment on some of the things that have been said so far today. But let's keep things in perspective on those guidelines. And, and I have to say that uh, Ambassador V. Mazel's comment that the EU guidelines were an encouragement to radical Islam and terrorism wouldn't face my, uh, wouldn't uh, face, uh, uh, meet, meet my uh, personal test of uh, being kept in perspective. Um, we, we, we also need to get our facts right, I think, on, on those guidelines. They do not affect in any way at all the economic relations between the European Union and firms linked uh, with settlements. That's not, not their aim at all. It was something, again, which uh, Gil Yuan alluded to, suggesting that they had some impact on uh, Jordan Valley farmers and their exports uh, to, to Europe. The only way that they, those guidelines would have an impact on Jordan Valley farmers is uh, if the farmers decide to give up farming and try to establish a biotechnology laboratory uh, in Area C of the West Bank and ask the EU to give them a grant uh, to pay for it. The EU guidelines are a very narrow piece uh, of policy guidance coming from Brussels, uh, which came out in July last year, and they put on a legal footing policy which we've already been administering, uh, whereby public taxpayers' money from the EU budget cannot be given as grants to Israeli research institutions or firms in the West Bank or for others to carry out activities there. It doesn't affect people who might have an activity in the West Bank, uh, but, are, but are established inside Israel and want to apply for EU money under the program uh, for activities, uh, activities there as well. So, you know, 
in, and, and in this way, they're no different really from the number of other programs implemented by a number of other foreign uh, governments, including, for example, the United States, uh, who's, uh, uh, where the US-Israel Binational Science Foundation uh, also applies a similar policy. When the reason we had the guidelines was that, although we tried to make sure that this didn't happen uh, with EU money, a small number of grants had slipped through the net and we didn't have any means to recover those funds without uh, uh, a sound legal framework. So as I say, it's, quite, it's, a, it's a narrow, uh, they, they, have a, they have a much narrower focus than uh, has been suggested in a lot of the coverage in the press here. And I would also refute the argument of double standards as well. I mean, um, let me just take the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus case, and other others have been raised here as well. I should say the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Um, I mean, there is no direct trade at all between the EU uh, and Northern Cyprus. Uh, we actually apply a much, much stricter uh, approach uh, to, to Northern Cyprus than to uh, settlements in the West Bank. Uh, our, I was interested to hear Dan Katariva's comments about uh, how much trade he believes uh, uh, is done between the EU and, and settlements. Settlement goods, of course, are allowed into the EU market. And we actually import more from the settlements uh, than we do from the Palestinian Authority. So, I mean, if there was an argument about double standards, it might uh, just as well go, uh, go the other way. But what can we do to improve, uh, improve relations? Um, I mean, as well as keeping things in perspective and being very clear, I think, about our facts, I want to say, could split this into two halves. Firstly, this morning our ambassador referred again to the special privilege partnership which the EU offered to uh, Israel in the context of a resolution of the, con of the conflict. That is, I think, extremely important. I mean, it is an unprecedented uh, offer. It hasn't been laid out in, 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 uh, in you know, it's not a, a, a document of uh, 12 articles uh, describing how everything will actually work. Mrs. Ashton has said it would be something that we would, be have, we would negotiate uh, with Israel a similar partnership has been offered to the Palestinians and would need to be tailor-made to their needs as well. Uh, but Israel obviously has a much greater level of integration into the EU uh, already, uh, both politically, economically, and culturally. And that is something which we would want to build on in, an, in uh, an unprecedented way. That, of course, does depend on the resolution of the conflict. So uh, without uh, tr trying to uh, speculate too much about what's going to happen this week on, on that front, um, I think there are also a number of other areas where we can already work to, to improve, uh, improve relations. And I think Shlomo Avineri alluded to a number of these as, as well himself uh, already. Um, I mean, on the diplomatic front, the EU and, and Israel can stand up and work together on a wide range of issues, where, where either where we face similar challenges or where we fundamentally share the same values as well. Uh, and we can also expand our economic links uh, further too. Just on the economic links, I mean, I'm not an expert in that, but we had two people this morning already coming up with uh, some excellent ideas. Dan Katarivas, who was suggesting we expand the, uh, the economic links, which are largely driven by uh, large companies uh, at the moment between the EU and Israel, to make sure that small uh, businesses, small and medium-sized enterprises can take part in that. We're already trying to do something uh, on that score. We had a vice president from the European Commission here last year with a large trade delegation focused on small businesses, focused on, focused on innovation. Um, and it's rare these days, I think, for other uh, prime ministers uh, or presidents from the EU to come here uh, without a significant trade delegation as well. So that's something that we're definitely, definitely working on. And Saul Singer said we could uh, use these increased connections between smaller businesses uh, in the EU and Israel to lever together access to uh, emerging markets, which I thought was a very interesting suggestion. Um, but we can also work much uh, much closer together on a range of issues where, as I said, where we share the same values. One of those is uh, following uh, Israel's uh, re-engagement uh, with an institution which probably isn't particularly popular here, but the Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva. But as part of that, Israel has joined together uh, with what is known as the Western European and Others Group, or the so called Leo Group, uh, and we have a strong voice uh, in, uh, in Geneva in the work of the Human Rights Council. And there are a lot of areas, uh, whether it's uh, gender equality, or the rights of disabled people, where we could do a lot more to work together and promote our common values uh, uh, around, uh, in, in that type of forum. And on that, we'd be developing 
building on existing uh, cooperation which we already have in the United Nations system. And last year, for example, we were uh, both the EU and Israel uh, were, were very keen in pushing forward the arms trade treaty, uh, which was concluded there as well. So there are a whole load of areas, I think, where we can work together at the international level. And these, this could also translate into more concrete uh, work, I think, on the ground in, uh, in, for example, in developing countries. One of the outcomes of Mrs. Merkel's visit here uh, recently was uh, cooperation between Israel and Germany on an African development fund. Um, the EU is, is the largest provider of donor assistance in the world. Um, Israel obviously has great expertise in the issues of irrigation and water and so forth. And these are some. These are these are, I think, other examples of places where we can where we can work to, where we can work together. Um, I do want to say something uh, uh, something about anti-Semitism because it is actually an area where we do work together. Um, we have an annual working group uh, on anti-Semitism uh, to ex explore practice in combating hate crime uh, both uh, within the EU uh, and in and in Israel. Um, I know Professor Wistrich has been a, a, a participant uh, to this in, in the past. Uh, and this is an area where we where we're ready also to step up uh, to step up uh, our work. It is of course always very depressing to sit uh, through some presentations you know, providing examples of anti-Semitism uh, in Europe. But it, the sad reality is that uh, one could, uh, for example, put up a lot of uh, uh, examples from the internet now, in particular, uh, rather than newspapers, where this this phenomenon is growing. But it is something that we're that we're committed to working towards. And Prime Minister Cameron, in his speech to the Knesset, already. I can't remember how many tens of thousands of pages of anti-Semitic content have been removed from uh, 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 servers in the UK as a result of the work that they've done there. But this survey which the EU did carry out, which uh, uh, Manfred Gerstenfeld was referring to, uh, is very much uh, the EU wanting to uh, uh, understand this problem. Uh, we we organised the survey, uh, and it's, uh, I would encourage people to, to look at it on, on the internet. There's no hiding behind uh, what people's perceptions of the anti-Semitic anti incidents were. People were asked uh, to define it for themselves, uh, the Jewish population in, in those eight countries, when they considered that they'd been the victim of an anti-Semitic uh, uh, assault. And it was something which uh, was not, uh, exactly as Professor Richard Whispers was saying, not something which is focused only on, on the right. Um, I might have some slight mistakes in the figures, but I think of those who were responding to the survey, 27% said that uh, where they were able to identify a perpetrator, or where they claimed to identify a perpetrator of uh, an anti-Semitic attack, whether it was verbal or physical, 27% uh, identified that as coming from uh, someone of uh, Muslim uh, extremist views. I think 22% said uh, it was someone of right-wing uh, views, uh, European right-wing views, and some 20% from left-wing views. So it is a phenomenon. Uh, which is increasingly uh, uh, being tackled as well in Europe. But we have to keep up with the technology which is uh, allowing uh, uh, the dissemination uh, of anti-Semitic material in, in, in increasingly diverse ways. And, and that study, it didn't simply uh, record the situation, it set out, set out a range of recommendations uh, to the EU on how this should be tackled, <clears throat> including the setting up of special peace units to combat uh, anti-Semitic crime on the internet. I don't think we need to be, we shouldn't be leaving, uh, in terms of sort of concluding remarks on, uh, on how we improve relations from here. It's important, I think, not to leave it just to diplomats and businessmen. Um, we can encourage greater exchange between universities uh, and students, and in this context, I think it's very important that uh, collectively we, uh, we, you know, we, have the, we have a shared interest in com combating, in particular, any calls to boycott uh, uh, academic institutions whether they're from academic institutions in our, in, within the EU or from, from everywhere, and the importance of academic freedom uh, should be paramount. Um, and again, just from uh, Mrs. Merkel's recent visit, uh, there was a very interesting proposal to develop working visas for, for young people, uh, both uh, Germans to come here and Israelis to go to Germany uh, to be able to work. And that type of exchange, I think, is, is particularly important. It is important that uh, we, uh, we bring more uh, Europeans to Israel um, it's certainly something when I was posted here before, uh, I was <coughs> hosting many family and friends uh, who had never visited Israel before and probably wouldn't have done if I, if I wasn't living there. Uh, but they certainly do get a, a different perspective when, uh, when they're here. Um, 
Um, and just a final word on that, I would say that it's going to be uh, quite difficult for us to uh, improve these relations as long as the strike in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs continues, so we hope that that's, uh, that's over soon. We'll be able to talk to, to Mr. Rafi Schultz. So in conclusion, I would say, I mean, the important things are to keep, thing, keep things in perspective. The relationship is extremely strong, uh, has been for decades, and will continue to be so. Let's prepare for, uh, uh, let's prepare for a bright future, uh, and use to the maximum this offer of a special privileged partnership which the EU has offered uh, to Israel. And let's make, in the meantime, a stronger reality working together, both on those issues where we have shared values, but also some of those regional areas, which the American area was talking about, where we also have shared interests. I think it's important to say, you know, the, the, you mentioned it also, I think the EU isn't from Mars and Israel from Venus. We're both from the same planet, we're both from the same democratic part of the planet. Uh, we can work much more together on transnational challenges as well as in those areas which are in our own best interests as well.